company sponsor. I want to thank our sponsors, Eli Lilly and Company, for supporting Room Now Live and this particular session or pod dedicated to the spectrum of spondyloarthritis. Um, you're viewing Tuesday Night Rheumatology, and I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Uh, we have an exciting program. I'm again, I'm going to be showing you excerpts of three different 30-minute lectures that ran during Room Now Live on uh, March the um, 19th. Uh, and we're going to take some of the pearls from those lectures and discuss them with your questions and other questions at the end of the show. Uh, I'm going to pause in between each of these um, short uh, lectures. Again, they're about 12 to 16 minutes long. Um, and I want to ask you to, um, if you have questions, to write them in the Q&A part of um, your webinar. If you're viewing the live stream, on YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn. You can actually write in your question there and we'll also answer it here. So with that said, I'm going to queue up our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Jose Scher. Um, you know him for his famous work on the microbiome. And because of that, we asked Jose to um, lead off this session on spondyloarthritis, talking about the microbiome in SPA and PSA and what it all means. In the beginning of his talk, he did review that the microbiome is altered in many diseases, and it may be involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. Um, now, in this talk, he's going to get into how the microbiome may influence uh, response to drug therapy. So, Jose Scher from NYU Langone Health uh, and Medical School, where he is the director of the Psoriatic Arthritis Center. So, um, with that being said, we'll now listen to Dr. Jose Scher. And then, of course, uh, the favorite of many, uh, there is the fecal microbial transplantation, which is essentially the, the administration of a stool solution from a donor into the intestinal tract of a recipient. This can be achieved through many different routes and procedures. These include upper and lower endoscopy, enema, and most recently, even frozen caps. This procedure, uh, as you probably know, has been FDA approved for the treatment of refractory C. diff colitis and has proven quite effective in uh, uh, related conditions such as uh, IBD, right? This is based on uh, original data derived from uh, successful amelioration of ulcerative colitis in this case uh, in the focus study which is published in The Lancet um, about five or so years ago, uh, and showing that a multi-donor uh, intensive, which is daily, uh, FNT approach was superior to placebo in achieving both clinical and endoscopic remission, which is no different from the biologic uh, outcomes that we see using uh, ustikinumab or TNF. Uh, blockers, for example, just to give you a sense of what kind of responses uh, are being achieved with FMTs. So uh, the anecdotal evidence from uh, a year or two ago um, uh, revealed that it is possible to achieve drug-free remission in PSA, in this case, following fecal microbial transportation for another indication, right? Uh, it was uh, in a patient with C. diff colitis, which provided this proof of principle that modulating the gut microbial communities can indeed affect downstream uh, inflammation in both skin and joint domains. And based on all of these animal and human data, we now have the results of this uh, pilot and yet very important study named FLORA, which was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial comparing the efficacy and safety of one FMT procedure, that's important, uh, via under uh, upper endoscopy uh, versus sham solution in peripheral uh, PSA patients. So the primary endpoint was a little bit unusual, with a composite outcome based on shared decision making uh, 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 and determining treatment failure, both by uh, the physician and the patient at week 26. So that would be one of the caveats. But interestingly, and although, although under power there were only 15 or 16 participants in each arm, uh, the results showed that the group that received 
the sham solution performed unexpectedly very well and significantly better than the group receiving a, uh, receiving FMT. So this is curious and relevant for a couple of reasons. Um, a, in my view, the placebo group achieved ACR outcomes. Uh, they were similar to those seen in biologic therapies, which is incredibly uh, curious, right? You can see that in the right panel on the ACR 20s, 50s, and 70s uh, on the gray uh, bars. But second, the FMT group did rather poorly. Yeah, which in essence supports the notion that modulating uh, the gut communities does have an impact in systemic joint inflammation, at least in psoriatic arthritis. Whether this is related to donor, uh, recipient, or specific microbes, we cannot say based on this study because there was no microbiome-based uh, readout. But certainly more to come and much more to learn in the future as to whether or not this is uh, the way to go. Uh, switching gears, uh, a few words on uh, this tongue twister, pharmacomicrobiomics, which is this uh, uh, new discipline in many ways that investigates the effects of variations within the human microbiomes on the drugs that we prescribe. And this works pioneer, again, in both uh, the oncology uh, field, but also in the IBD field. For example, you can see a couple of studies here that I'm showing uh, that when you use machine learning algorithms, uh, predicting which patients will achieve steroid-free remission in both ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's disease, um, uh, you can see that this algorithm that incorporated uh, gut microbiome features improved the uh, predictive value uh, and went from an AUC of around uh, 0.6 uh, using the clinical features only in each one of these cases to uh, well above uh, 0.83 uh, when you incorporated uh, microbial features to the machine learning algorithm. Similarly, uh, our group in collaboration with uh, the Italian group led by Francesco Siccia uh, looked at whether uh, specifically 17, IL-17 blockade could actually lead to a gut dysbiotic response uh, by way of microbiome perturbation, that is fungal communities, with downstream aberrant um, activation of the immune system or response that could help potentially help explain, and at least partially, why a small proportion and emphasis on small of patients uh, develop IBD-like syndromes when exposed to IL-17 blockers. So we characterize uh, patients with spondyloarthritis in this case, uh, before and after uh, either TNF or IL-17 blockade and perform gut micro and microbiome analysis as well as shotgun sequencing. Uh, and curiously, uh, curiously, not only IL-17 inhibition led to more significant changes in the gut bacterial composition, you can see that on 16S with the cluster urealis leading the charge, but also we found that specifically candida expanded in about a third of patients compared to those that received uh, I, uh, TNF inhibitors. It's not surprising, right? It isn't surprising since oral candidiasis is found in some patients treated with IL-17 blockade. Uh, but these findings can also, in our view, uh, contribute to under our understanding of why a small group of patients uh, that are treated with 17 blockers ultimately develop IBD and, can, and, and essentially the question of can we use the uh, microbiome features to predict who amongst those will end up developing uh, the adverse event. So uh, finally, um, the question of can any of these be applied to clinical decision making and the lessons uh, that we are learning from methotrexate in rheumatoid arthritis in this case. So we've learned a uh, significant amount about the metabolic fate of methotrexate, what happens once patients uh, that have been prescribed with this drug uh, uh, ingest methotrexate. We know uh, a lot because there's an established high, very high, inter individual variability of methotrexate oral bioavailability, which ranges anywhere from 20 to 80 percent, depending on the studies you look at and the populations of uh, study. Uh, 
and its absor uh, the absorption of methotrexate seems to be at least partially limited by gut epithelial transporters, which appear to be saturable at around at a dose of around 15 milligrams or so. But this is probably an incomplete picture, mainly because the field has established uh, about 50 years ago, a half a century and now, that methotrexate is effectively metabolized by intestinal bacteria, at least in mice, right? So this is very elegantly uh, demonstrated by um, NIH investigators, uh, Lorena and colleagues who demonstrated that wild type animals, you know, animals that are raised under normal circumstances can actually metabolize the majority of methotrexate that uh, they get gavaged with into DAMPA, which is this uh, known inactive uh, metabolite of methotrexate. However, both uh, in antibiotic treated mice, you deplete the gut microbes, and under germ-free conditions, which is uh, the same uh, outcome, methotrexate remains mostly intact, right? You have ash animals with, with methotrexate and most of it re, uh, remains in the, um, in the original form and the inactive metabolite, it's not seen. Um, and so this suggests for the most part that methotrexate does, um, uh, does have a, um, a, a relationship with the microbi uh, microbiota uh, in mice that can now uh, modulate its downstream effect. So about a, a decade ago, we first found that patients with new onset uh, drug naive rheumatoid patients uh, had a markedly distinct uh, gut microbiome dominated by a specific microbe. That's a really matter for the copy. But then as the question uh, as to whether or not methotrexate actually led to perturbations in the overall microbial composition and found that although the number of species or OTUs uh, diminished very dramatically in those receiving my, uh, vancomycin, uh, and you can see that in the red bars, those rheumatoid patients uh, on standard care methotrexate did not have a significant change in their gut bacterial OTUs or species here in blue, uh, suggesting that methotrexate does not directly affect the amount and relative abundance of uh, various bacterial attacks. I mean, this off-target effect or antibiotic effect was not seen at that time. So fast forwarding to uh, this past year, we just published on how the based on gut microbiome and its functional genes, very important, or different rheumatoid patients that respond to methotrexate compared to the microbiome of those that do not. Uh, moreover, we've established uh, for the first time that human gut bacteria can indeed meta metabolize methotrexate. And by using uh, random forest modeling, we're able to predict with a high degree of confidence future clinical response, right? So previously uh, proposed clinical pharmacogenetic models were of relevance, but this model appears to surpass the previously proposed uh, models, suggesting that the gut microbiome can potentially be used for precision medicine approaches in inflammatory arthritis in general. So here's the study design. We'll go through this quite quickly, but we first enroll a discovery cohort of patients with nuanced rheumatoid patients, uh, arthritis that is, and follow them longitudinally to classify them as either responders or non-responders based on a very stringent definition, um, dependent on the STUNY uh, reduction. And to do so, we collected based on microbiome, subjected uh, the samples to both 16S and shotgun sequencing with the goal of understanding if any differences could be uh, characteristic of non-response. And in fact, we did uh, see initially the patients that did not respond to methotrexate had a higher gut microbiota uh, diversity and also a differential abundance of several taxa when compared to samples uh, from responders. But more importantly, we think, uh, is that we found uh, differential bacterial pathways and gene orthodox in the treatment microbiome, in the pretreatment microbiome of the training cohort of these NORA patients, new onset rheumatoid patients. Briefly, we observed 
significant differences in multiple gene orthologs within the gut maillat genome of responders versus non responders. Uh, to methotrexate, uh, we then applied this random forest to a training cohort and found that about 38 out of more than 450 gene orthologs were highly predictive of response. And finally, validating the model in an independent cohort and found that uh, the metagenomics model, similarly to what we see in the IBD literature, was significantly more robust in predicting methotrexate response than a previously for formulated um, clinical pharmacogenetic model. So taking together, um, here is the imperfect but somehow logical model where we um, uh, are pursuing uh, uh, to better connect all these moving dots. In the proportion of rheumatoid patients, we believe there's a relatively low abundance of microbes that can encode for methotrexate metabolizing enzymes so that the majority of ingested drug is absorbed in the systemic compartment and then act uh, downstream to mitigate joint inflammation. But in other patients, uh, they may actually carry a higher abundance of these enzymes by transforming methotrexate in, within the intestinal lumen and ultimately preventing its absorption and clinical uh, utility. Um, so, but as I said, the model is quite imperfect because since in um, collaboration with uh, Renu Kanayak and Pete uh, Turnbaugh at UCSF, we just showed that methotrexate at higher doses also have off-target effects on human gut microbiota uh, in cell cultures, in mice, and also in patients. This was less so on the overall uh, uh, community structure of gut bacteria, but rather impacting the expression of uh, conserved metabolic pathways and their activity in gut bacteria. And importantly, some of these shifts also associated with methotrexate response, suggesting that the off-target effects uh, bacteriostatic, if you will, of methotrexate on the gut microbiota can also have consequences uh, for immune function and response. So um, to summarize, uh, I hope I was able to articulate the fact that there's emerging data implicating uh, gut human microbiome as determinant of both pathogenesis, spondylarthritis, and drug efficacy and toxicity uh, in these diseases and related conditions, that multi-OMI platforms allow for the generation of predictive tools and also for mechanic, mechanistic studies, excuse me. Um, and finally, this idea that we can now uh, exploit the microbiome uh, and consider uh, it for an effective uh, and rational way of initiating anti-rheumatic disease drugs and the potential to be incorporated into uh, uh, precision medicine uh, strategies. So thank you, Jose. That was really interesting, was it not? Um, I mean, I heard things there that I haven't heard, and I've heard a lot of microbiome lectures, including um, the consideration that the microbiome, meaning the fungal flora, within the gut could also be playing a role here. And that was well demonstrated by IL-17 inhibition in, in spa patients uh, in that model. Um, the other thing I thought that was interesting here was that if you can harness this information based on the IBD literature and based on what he just showed with methotrex their methotrexate study in new onset RA patients, you can augment treatment responses by up to 20%. Remember going from an AUC of 0.6 to an AUC of 0.8 or higher, that's a 20% or more uh, improvement. That's quite impressive to say the least. So um, I thought that was interesting. So I hope that you did too. Um, we can move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, as you know, um, we, we are gonna take some questions at the end. So please write them into the, um, the, uh, Q, the Q and A a portion of uh, the screen there. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Phil Meese. As you know, Phil is um, a legendary and a great friend. He is director of rheumatology research at the Swedish Medical Center and Providence in Washington, Seattle. We asked Philip to talk about 
axial spondyloarthritis, where he has some really interesting data. Um, look at this case, um, and then he's going to do a polling question with the audience. The case is a 53-year-old um, woman with psoriatic arthritis, polyarthritis, enthesitis, uh, scalp and nail disease. She had been on adalimumab, then went on golimumab, sertilizumab, ustekinumab, ixekizumab, and has lost response with ixekizumab. She has comorbidities. And then of late, when she's not doing well, she's having back pain. An MRI done shows normal SIs, but shows um, spinal arthritis by looking at the spinal lesions with these Romanus lesions. And he asked the question, uh, what are you going to do next? Uh, in for MRI scanning. So here's the question. Uh, after ixekizumab, which is the last in this cycle, which agent might you next choose? Secukinumab, a JAK inhibitor, an IL-23 inhibitor, or a different TNF inhibitor? I'll tell you right now, there's no exactly right answer. <laughs> Uh, you've got you. You may have different preferences here. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, results. Interesting. Okay, so even in this patient with cardiovascular risk, etc. Okay, uh, and so. Um, uh, uh, now, so it, it's clear that what you're wanting to do is move to a different mechanism of action and one that has known efficacy in spondyl arthritis as evidenced by the positive data that we've seen from tofacitinib and upadacitinib trials uh, in ankylosing spondylitis. Psychokinumab is second, it looks like, although it just looked like it shrunk a little bit there. And then uh, uh, some of you would actually choose an IL-23 inhibitor and some would go back to trying a different TNF inhibitor. So it looks like there's a range of choices here. Here is the uh, uh, evidence. I already earlier talked to you about the uh, treatment recommendations that have been forthcoming. This is the, uh, from the 2021 treatment recommendations from the GRAPA group. And here I'm focusing in on the axial um, uh, arthritis aspect. And it's divided into those that are biologic naive or biologic experience. Uh, and so what you see in the first box are all the different approaches that have shown efficacy in at least ankylosing spondylitis trials, and in some instances, non-radiographic uh, axial spa trials. So, uh, we've got NSAIDs, physiotherapy, analgesia, simple analgesia, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. So that supports the choices that you've just been making uh, in relation to the, uh, the patient we just saw. Uh, yeah, and the same is true for biologic and adequate responding population. If we go over toward the right, we can see that there's a strong recommendation against CSD mards such as methotrexate or sulfasalazine, and that's because we just haven't, in ankylosing spondylitis, ever shown efficacy of those drugs compared to placebo in spinal aspects of the disease. There's a bit of evidence in ank spond that uh, sulfasalazine can uh, help peripheral manifestations, but not spinal manifestations. And then on the far right, there is this group that's no recommendation, insufficient evidence. And we're going to explore this a little bit. And you might wonder, well, gee, if IL-23 inhibitor uh, therapy is just a bit upstream from IL-17 inhibitor therapy, why shouldn't it work? And we're going to get into this. So here is uh, data from the only trial that has been dedicated to axial PSA to date. All of the other data, data that went into the evidence base for the TNF inhibitors, the JAK inhibitors, et cetera, has been extrapolated from ankylosing spondylitis trials or non-radiographic axial spa trials. 
So the way this maximized study was done was that about 500 patients were entered. The uh, key point was whether the investigator thought they had axial PSA or not. Now that could have been based on them knowing something about the history of the patient. It could have been based on previous imaging that had been done, et cetera. But that was the basis for it. There was not a requirement for an imaging inclusion criteria. Imaging was done, and it was done throughout the trial, MRI scanning and so forth, but you didn't have, like you do with most AXPA trials, where there was a, you, you would determine the entry based on the findings of either sacroiliac abnormalities or spinal abnormalities consistent with spondylitis. So all of these patients launched into the trial and it turns out that they actually kind of, just on face value, they fit. Somewhere between 20 and 30 percent were B27 positive. They all had back pain. They all had significant back pain uh, in order to get into the trial. Uh, and so it was a believable population. And as you can see, uh, the ASAS-20 response at the end of 12 weeks was somewhat similar to what we've seen uh, in uh, uh, secukinumab trials in ankylosing spondylitis. It works, and clearly separated from placebo. What was fascinating is that only about 60% of the patients that entered the trial and went on through it had MRI abnormalities consistent with spondylitis. 40% did not. Yet when you looked at the results, not only did the MRI positive patients have the kind of improvements that we would expect in both the spine and the joints from an effective therapy, but the MRI positive and MRI negative patients also responded similarly. So it looks like the drug works regardless of whether they're MRI positive or not, but a challenge to us who are in the process of developing a classification criteria for axial PSA is how do we include these patients that end up being MRI negative into a classification schema? That's going to be, I, I don't have an answer for that. That's going to be a challenge. Uh, uh, but I think it bespeaks the fact that there is a, 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 a group of patients with PSA who may not have what we tend to depend on as objective evidence uh, for inflammation in the spine. So one of the reasons why spine disease has not been as thoroughly assessed in our phase three trials of psoriatic arthritis is be for several reasons. One, because this is only a subset of the patients in a trial, 30%, for example, maybe, uh, it's the, the, that group is not powered to give us an answer about response in the spine. It would require doing serial imaging, uh, including MRI, which is going to be expensive to do. And in, with drugs that are going to go through an ankylosing spondylitis approval anyway, uh, such as the TNF inhibitors did, or the JAK inhibitors, or the IL-17s, why go to all that trouble? Just use that ankylosing spondylitis data as a surrogate for thinking that the, the drugs are going to be effective uh, in axial PSA. They're yeah, close enough, why not? And, and your own clinical experience would support that. However, uh, you're, as you'll see in a moment, this doesn't always work. And so we need to do, uh, I think, increasingly we need to understand are there some key differences between the axial PSA group of patients that may portend different responses to treatment. Now one way around do, uh, doing uh, a formal trial has been to throw a BASTI measure into the, into the mix. But there's challenges with that. The BASTI was really only uh, created uh, for measurement of response, uh, tr of disease activity and response in uh, ankylosing spondylitis or the broader field of axial spa. 
Uh, and many of the questions are nonspecific enough that they can, if you have a patient with very active peripheral disease, they're going to have a high BAS dye, and it may respond to treatment just based on peripheral improvement. Here are the uh, six patient uh, reported questions that are part of the BAS dye. As you can see, they're not all axial related. Fatigue, there's question number two, which arguably is related to the spine. Pain, swelling, and other joints. Overall discomfort from tender areas, that includes enthesitis. And then two questions about morning stiffness, which is a surrogate for inflammation. So here's a key study that was done uh, in a group of five centers. Um, uh, Sumia Reddy at NYU was the lead author. Alexis Ogdi at Penn, who you heard from earlier today, uh, was the senior author. And they uh, asked the question amongst 117 patients with PSA, who, some of whom had axial disease uh, that was uh, determined and others who did not. And at baseline and after treatment, they looked at responses and found that there was no difference between those that had spine disease and those who didn't. So this really, unfortunately, impugns use of the BASTI as a surrogate in these trials. So then the, the, we come to, we've already established that we've got several drugs that have shown good efficacy in X-Bond. We've got the uh, secukinumab data and axial PSA. Now we come to the IL-23 pathway. And uh, this is an older slide that shows that IL-23 is key in turning on or uh, stimulating TH17 cells to produce IL-17 and so forth, so it's considered to be upstream from IL-17, so shouldn't it work? Here we have the results of a small phase two trial uh, in ankylosing spondylitis with rizinkizumab, which is a P19 IL-23 inhibitor, completely flat, no difference from placebo. Here we have a trial with ustekinumab. This was actually a surprise because there was a 20 patient open label study done in Germany that appeared to show great response to ustekinumab in ankylosing spondylitis. Here is a trial in ankylosing spondylitis, big phase three study, which showed no difference from placebo. So this led to um, several of us being asked to write editorials about why we thought that uh, IL-23 inhibition didn't work. And so there were a number of different ideas besides uh, vagaries about the patient population uh, that uh, were uh, potentially an issue, including the fact that IL-17 could be uh, present uh, in uh, the spine uh, and regardless of any IL-23 stimulation. So other sources of IL-17 coming from resident immune cells. Uh, that there were differences in IL-23 secreting myeloid cells in the spine compared to peripheral sites. So a basic immunobiologic difference might be present. There might be a difference in, quote, tissue cytokine hierarchy with some uh, cytokines being more important than others in different, depending upon the domain that you're looking at. Uh, differences in one uh, pathology being more bone related uh, and not as much enthesial related. So various ideas were thrown out there. Here's from uh, uh, work by Stefan Siebert in the Glasgow group suggesting that there are different uh, important cytokines in these different tissues that are part of PSA. But wait, here we have an interesting sub-analysis uh, of the DISCOVER 1 and 2 trials with another P19 IL-23 inhibitor, Guzelcomab. Uh, and in this particular trial, what was done was to uh, uh, have the investigators identified the patients they thought had axial PSA at the outset, and then they had to have evidence of, um, if you look at the first bullet underneath the table here, 
sacro, they had to have evidence of sacroiliac changes either on an x-ray that was locally read, mind you, uh, or an MRI scan. So some evidence that, had been, that there had been some sacroiliac problem, presumably inflammation leading to the appearance of sacroiliitis. So that objective marker combined with the investigator. And again, this looked to be a pretty characteristic group. About 20 to 30 percent of the patients were HLA-B27 positive. It overall was 30 percent of the two uh, phase three trials. Uh, uh, so that fit with what we know about the epidemiology of axial PSA. So it seemed to fit. And they all had high spine pain at the, at the outset. So here are the results using best eye scores. And as you can see, there was statistical separation between treatment groups and placebo, two different dose arms of guzelcomab. And that was sustained out through week 52. And even when you looked at just the spinal pain question, there seemed to be a difference. And a modified BAST eye where they took out the joint question, peripheral joint question. Using a slightly more objective measure, the ASDAS score, there was also clear-cut improvement, including what, uh, what we call ASDAS in active disease. So for all intents and purposes, it looks like this drug actually helps the, at least the symptoms in axial PSA. Is this the end of the story? No, it's not. Uh, they, uh, as noted uh, in the uh, second bullet, uh, Jensen is proceeding ahead with a specific trial in axial PSA. It'll be a big trial. And in order to get into the study, the patients are going to have to have MRI evidence of abnormalities of either the sacroiliac joints or spine in order to be part of the study. And this will give us, hopefully, with all the bells and whistles of serial MRI scans and so on, this will give us a more definitive answer about this, uh, this question. In parallel, the ASAS and GRAPA groups are in the process of uh, developing a classification criteria to better harmonize, homogenize who it is that we want to be studying uh, when we're doing uh, clinical studies. And another independent uh, investigator study that a number of us are involved in is to try to molecularly characterize differences between those patients with axial PSA versus PSA, and then in the future to molecularly uh, uh, distinguish from axial SPA. So all of this is proceeding to try to help us uh, along the way here. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much, Dr. Meese. Um, interesting data, because prior to really that maximized study and the sub-analysis of the Discover 1, Discover 2 data, pretty much everyone was saying IL-23 doesn't work in axial disease. And that helps you in deciding whether you use an IL-17 inhibitor or IL-23 inhibitor in treating patients with spondyloarthritis and or ankle or, or psoriatic arthritis and whatnot. So now looking at the subset of PSA that has axial disease, maybe that's not so true. Uh, and that kind of opens up this whole area into new investigations. And that's what Dr. Mies, I think, is pointing out here quite, um, quite well. Uh, I want to remind you to put any questions you may have in the Q&A session. I want to remind you to thank um, Lily, the people who make Ixikizumab, um, who sponsored this session. Um, because of it, we're able to do a replay of this particular session at Room Now Live. Uh, our next presentation is on pediatric spondyloarthritis. Um, Dr. Pamela Weiss, who um, is known for her work in this area, she comes from CHOP and the Perlman School of uh, Medicine. Uh, we asked her to address the issue of J-SPA, and she does so uh, at the beginning of her lecture, and now she gets into uh, other things like attention to in pediatrics and adult onset disease.
The screening guidelines that are listed at the top right of the slide are from the ACR AF guidelines and are based on JIA category, ANA status, and age of onset of disease, as well as disease duration. The risk for asymptomatic uveitis and psoriatic arthritis is generally considered quite high. In ERA, like adult onset spa, the eye inflammation is typically symptomatic and screening is generally recommended only once a year. So moving on from sequelae to the epidemiology and disease course of JSPA, this is data from a cross-sectional study of 95 subjects, 21 of whom had ERA. The median disease duration of study entry was 3.5 years. Outcomes of interest were function as measured by the track, which is akin to the hack, well-being and pain. On the left are outcomes for the entire JAA cohort, and on the right are just for children with ERA. And what I want you to focus on is that half of the ERA patients had moderate to severe functional impairment, moderate severe impaired well-being, and 43% of the children reported severe pain. So these kids need some help, and we're doing kind of a so-so job at the moment. So moving on, so moving on to our second focus area at the top, we have axial disease, a disease manifestation that's likely well known to you, but with a pediatric twist. For starters, here's what we know about axial disease in kids. So 10 to 20% of adults with AS have symptom onset during childhood. Inflammatory back pain is less common in children and rarely present at disease onset. Sacroiliitis is common, spondylitis is rare. Sacroiliitis occurs in up to two-thirds of children within 10 years of diagnosis, and risk factors that we know of in the juvenile population include hip arthritis, elevated inflammatory markers, as well as HLA-B27. So the next question we usually ask is when do we start to think about axial disease in kids? Before I give you the answer to this, I'm going to do a juvenile onset imaging pretest for you. And these are the answers. So the question again is, when do we start to look for axial disease in children? Should we look for a diagnosis? Turns out we really should. So this is data from pros pro prospective cross-sectional study of J-SPOT in healthy children, eight to 18 years of age. Cases were 40 children with new newly diagnosed J-SPOT, 36 with ERA and four with PSA. Controls were 14 age and sex mask healthy children. And what you can see here is that uh, eight or 20% of the children or cases with newly diagnosed SPA had evidence on imaging of acute sacroiliitis. 50% of it was bilateral. What's a little bit scary is the majority of them also, even though this was new onset disease, already had evidence of damage on MRI. And what was even scarier is that only three of the eight people with imaging um, sacroiliitis complained of back pain by history or physical exam. So while I've told you a couple of times already, back pain um, is less common in children of presentation, it really doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about this disease manifestation of presentation. And doing predictive probability, we found that children who were HLA B27 positive and had elevated inflammatory markers of diagnosis were most at risk of this complication. So how do we screen for this in children? So x-rays are the classic go-to, um, but I'm gonna tell you why we don't like pelvic x-rays in kids based on data. So this was a retrospective cross-sectional study of children with suspected or confirmed SPA who underwent pelvic radiograph and MRI within six months of one another with an aim to evaluate the utility of radiograph prior to MRI when evaluating for disease. So images were scored independently by five MSK imaging experts. And across raters, the discordance between x-rays and MRIs ranged from 48 to 66% uh, for positive radiograph negative MRI scans. On the right of this slide are two illustrative cases from the study. A and B are from a 16-year-old boy. In A, the radiograph was rated normal by all five raters. MRI shown in B of the same patient was rated abnormal by all five raters. So bilateral subchondral bone marrow edema was clearly present. Two raters also reported damage, including erosion and sclerosis. This um, first case illustrates x-rays aren't useful to detect early disease, which we knew, 
Um, in C and D, we see imaging of a 13-year-old girl with low and mid back pain who also has morning stiffness, acute uveitis, and multiple tender indices. The X-ray in C was rated abnormal by all five raters, including findings of erosion, joint space narrowing, and sclerosis. D is the corresponding MRI, uh, which was rated as completely normal by all five raters. So this illustrates that in children in particular, X-rays are often falsely positive. So the results should impact your practice if you see youth. Uh, radiographs really have limited utility in screening for sacroiliitis in kids, result in a significant proportion of false negative and false positive findings, as well as unnecessary anxiety, radiation exposure, and cost to the family. <clears throat> so MRIs are the cornerstone of evaluation for non-radiographic spot in adults. It will come as no surprise that MRI is also the cornerstone modality for axial disease evaluation in pediatrics. However, once again, there's a twist. In the normal maturing pelvis, we often see bright apophysial cartilage that can be easily mistaken by uh, inexperienced readers for inflammation. Shown here are T1 and STIR pelvic sequences of an 11-year-old pubertal boy. STIR is a fluid sensitive sequence, so the preferred sequence for looking for inflammation. And as you can see here with the help of the arrows on the right, there is a homogeneous and symmetric bright subconscious signal that extends along the sacral apophyses. I like to describe this to my fellows as what looks like tracing along the sacral side of the joint with a sharpie. This is a very normal finding in the sacroiliac joint and not pathology. So this study uh, by Chauvin et al described the normal appearance of the maturing SIJ in healthy children. So using images prospectively collected on 70 healthy kids ages 8 to 18, this team developed an ordinal system that grades the amount of subconscious signal seen in the healthy maturity skeleton, ranging from stage 1 to 4. And the take-home points from this study were children progress from type 1 to 4 as they approach adulthood. The metaphysical equivalent signal in the healthy um, child is homogeneous and symmetric. Um, on the top left, we see type 1 change is characterized again by homogeneous bright subconscious signal extending along the sacral apophyses. Types 1 and 2 signal were present in most prebirtal children, and as they approach skeletal maturity, type 1 signal disappears, and type 2, two signal was uh, detectable in only a minority. Type 4 on the lower right is essentially what you're used to seeing in adults. So again, as rheumatology providers, we should know about these changes in the SIJ and be aware that normal signal can be mistaken for inflammatory change by those not used to viewing pediatric studies. So this is another way to visualize the frequency of these findings. Again, type 1, 2, and 3 are present in the majority of prepubertal children. By the time they start to approach skeletal majority, type 1 signal disappears, type 2 signal is there in less than 10%. And when we looked at these results stratified by males versus females, females seem to start out with more type 1 signal, but seem to progress the type 4 signal faster. So MRI um, can also be tricky in youth for reasons other than evaluation of active inflammation. So as part of the study of 70 healthy kids, we also evaluated the prevalence of cortical irregularities. And we found that SIJ cortical irregularities are really common. They occur most often along the ilium and are really numerous in the peripubertal group. Uh, these findings cor correlate with prior autopsy findings, which reported that the sacroiliac bony surfaces are smooth until puberty and then often develop bony ridges and grooves, primarily of the ilium. This finding is different from that seen in adults in whom irregularities may uh, infer degenerative change. Again, it's important to recognize these features as they're variations in normal anatomy and we don't want them mistaken for erosions. I include this next study because it highlights how problematic interpretation of the SIJs in kids can be. In this study, eight hospitals each contributed up to 20 cases of consecutively imaged children and adolescents with JAA and suspected sacroiliitis. All the studies were independently reviewed by three pediatric radiologists and the test properties of local reports were calculated using central imaging team majority of the, as a reference standard. Now, as you can see on this table, the sensitivity for uh, local reports for detecting active sacroiliitis and MRI was quite high and ranged from 80 to 100 percent across sites, with an overall sensitivity of 93 percent, meaning few cases were missed. 
However, the positive predictive value of the local reports ranged widely from 12.5% to 100%, with an overall positive predictive value of only 52%, meaning there were a lot of false positives. To highlight the issues shown here um, are two images from this study that were read as positive from the local report and negative by the central imaging team. A is a coronal oblique image showing homogeneous uniform symmetric increased signal in the sacral LA periphery. The increased signal extends along the entire sacrum and the dashed arrow shows the increased signal also extends within the cartilage of the sacral bodies. B is an axial T2 fat sat showing a hyperintense metaphysical equivalent signal along the SIJ that is similar in intensity than metaphysical equivalent signal along the iliac crest. Again, both of these images are normal, but were rated as abnormal by the local radiology team. So again, you should care about this study because there is a great need for increased training of radiologists and rheumatologists to become familiar with the normal appearance of the SIJ. So now we'll move on to our last focus of the talk, which is management. So in pediatrics, like adult onset disease, the management is driven by the number of involved joints and the presence or absence of axial disease. For the treatment of oligoarticular disease or less than five joints, we typically perform joint injections. And if repeat injections are needed, we move on to a DMARD, most often methotrexate. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, she was going to get into the management of polyarticular J. As you know, there are many drugs that are approved for that. And then more recently, there's um, a new approval of a biologic that would be um, secukinumab was approved this year. Um, the Junipera study, uh, Hermine Bruner was the author on that. And that led to the approval of IL-17 inhibition in kids with um, ERA and um, uh, enthesitis related arthritis, um, the spinal arthritis variant, uh, and that's from age two and above. So I think that's an important um, advance in those patients. So three very interesting presentations covering uh, the spectrum of what's out there. Um, we have um, a few questions to get into, uh, and we have seven minutes remaining. Um, uh, we have a question about when, uh, not related to spinal arthritis, but nonetheless a question about the use of um, uh, the Shing Shingrix vaccine uh, in someone who's had shingles um, and when you can use a JAK inhibitor. As you know, JAK inhibitors do increase the odds of getting shingles. Um, I reflexly, almost in everyone, try to get everybody vaccinated prior to or soon, as soon as I give them the JAK inhibitor, because the odds go up at you know anywhere from four to eight fold higher um, once you're on a JAK inhibitor. So if you have shingles, um, um, most people will stop whatever treatment you're on temporarily. And I would say two to four weeks seems to be reasonable while you treat the, the shingles event and then restart it. There is no firm guideline on this. Um, can um, when to start a JAK inhibitor after someone received um, uh, the Shingrix? Again, I would do the same thing. Um, the uh, benefits of Shingrix obviously take, because it's a humoral response to the injection, are going to take you know more than four weeks, but at least it begins by then. Two to four weeks would be the answer to that particular question. So uh, I hope you find that found that helpful. Um, a number of questions appeared about um, uh, the whole methotrexate and gut microbiome issue. Um, what can be done to, one question was to decrease the um, um, metabolism of uh, methotrexate. Um, actually, it's a, if you increase the metabolism of methotrexate, I think you get the effect because one of the effects is absorption and that's partly a transporter issue. But then there are other effects too that we don't quite understand. Um, there is no solution right now. There's no research that says that a, a certain diet is gonna be effective or, the, or manipulating the microbiome through probiotic use is going to be effective. That really has not been well studied. Another question asked, what about sub-Q methotrexate, meaning parenteral methotrexate? Do I have to worry about that? Well, that hasn't been studied, but that has been studied in those 
GI studies he showed you on um, ulcer colitis and Crohn's disease. That was using drugs that are IV administered and the effects of the gut microbiome on responses there. Moreover, he didn't show you the data, and I, I have seen him show the data, about the same issue with checkpoint inhibitors. So patients who are getting immune checkpoint inhibitors as part of immunotherapy, there are very elegant studies showing that the microbiome clearly influences better and makes for better responses in patients receiving the checkpoint inhibitors. So this is not a direct, you know, um, effect of the colonic mucosa on drug absorption per se. It's a, it's a much bigger issue. And I think that um, studying the microbiome is gonna be important regardless of whether you're getting oral or parenterally administered drugs. Um, dietary recommendations for people with RA, PSA, SPA. Um, I don't think anybody has a strong one. Most people would say um, a Mediterranean diet, a diet that's low in gluten and carbohydrates um, has anti-inflammatory potential. I have a bunch of anecdotes about that working in my patient population. Obviously, patients like manipulating their diet and having some control over their disease. But again, that, I don't think that's been really, really well studied. Um, um, at the time of this particular presentation in mid-March, uh, only tofacitinib was FDA approved for use in spondylitis. Since then, actually, I guess it was two, three weeks ago, uh, upadacitinib was also approved for use in ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and so that was a question that came up um, that people should know about. So at least right, right now, the other jack inhibitors are not baricitinib and other ones that are in development. Um, uh, do you need to have uh, a question for Dr. Weiss was, do you need to have a um, trained radiologist to read those MRIs? And um, I don't know that you saw it, but in Dr. Mises' presentation, it really helps. Just to have a musculoskeletal radiologist certainly helps over a regular radiologist, but to have one trained in reading MRs in spondylitis really helps as well. In spite of all that Dr. Um, Weiss showed us about bone marrow edema, bone marrow edema has been shown to not have great predictive value in spondylitis. That the most, the only thing you can really hang your hat on in spondylitis is erosions. Erosions count. Bone marrow edema, worry a little bit, but you know, there's MRs of the SI joints in, in um, you know, house cleaning employees, hockey players, long distance runners showing SI bone marrow edema signal that would lead you astray because those people did not have spondylitis, right? Um, and I think, uh, let's see, how robust was the data for JAK inhibitors in AS? It looks good. It looks as good um, at least at the arthritis outcomes. Obviously, if you're looking at any other outcomes, um, and I say the anthocytis and, and, and dactylitis study, study outcomes in PSA also look as good, but also even in spondylitis. So uh, again, it's gonna be hard to know exactly who should get these drugs. Right now, I say JAK inhibitors are in line behind IL-17 and maybe IL-23 because they're just now getting approved and we just now have some early data about that. Um, lastly, there are questions about germ-free animals. Do germ-free animals have microbiomes? And the answer is they do. They, they have to, to survive. And that microbiome is usually based on the mother's microbiome and breast milk. Um, but I'll remind the, the audience of research done at UT Southwestern, where I worked back in the 90s by Dr. Joel Torog, where he showed that rats that were transfected with the HLA-B27, human HLA-B27 gene, developed human-like spondyloarthritis disease. They had the nail changes of psoriasis, they had colitis, they had orchitis, they had spinal changes, et cetera. Yet when he did the same experiment and raised those rats in germ-free environments, they did not develop disease. So germ-free um, or was the same as antibiotic treated. Um, uh, animals in those studies. And so it seems like it's the um, either the stability and the lack of change of the microbiome that might be the beneficial thing, but it remains to be seen how we're going to be able to manipulate the microbiome to lead to a better outcome, uh, at least in spondyloarthritis and ankle and, and psoriatic arthritis. And, and again, it's being researched also for rheumatoid arthritis 
and also for um, patients who are lupus. As a, in a, Craig Silverman has really interesting papers about the microbiome and lupus responses. I want to re, uh, show you a slide of our um, program uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, as you know, we're going to continue doing Tuesday night rheumatology. Uh, and uh, next week, um, we're going to talk about RA again with great lectures by Janet Pope on cycling and switching therapies, Elena Maestadova from Mayo talking about multimorbidity in RA, and Karen Kostenbatter from Boston talking about preventing rheumatoid arthritis, a really interesting um, session that we'll be replaying next Tuesday, May the 24th. In the weeks that follow, we're going to have another session on psoriasis with two dermatologists on the program and one rheumatologist dermatologist on the program, Joe Marola. That was a really well-received session. And our last session on June the 7th is called Hot Topics. John House been talking about transition from uh, pediatric to adult care. And then Tahina Nioji and Philip Meese talking about um, uh, pain control and central sensitization. Two really interesting presentations. that got a lot of questions at uh, our past meeting of Room Now Live. I want to remind you to uh, listen to our podcast. Uh, you can ask a question by going to the website or the email and finding that little box that says, ask Kush anything. If you got a question or case, especially you nurse practitioners and physician assistants, um, I'll discuss it on the podcast. Uh, we'll see you next week. Hope you enjoyed this session. Thanks and good night.